How are we doing? All right. So congrats to our, uh, you know, to Michael and to, well, Michael and Michael, right, for, for your uh, Kevin, Award, Kevin Charlie Stiffen Awards, right? Very, very well deserved and, and great presentations by you and certainly other grad students here. So, so we're going to focus for the next little while on choline and methionine. And, you know, the root of this presentation really grew out of some uh, um, things I would hear, right, from the field and things like that. Well, you know, do you need both in diets? Do you need one in diets? Can you just feed one, not the other, right? How interchangeable are they, right? Do you just feed more of one and et cetera, et cetera. And so that's really where this, where this kind of grew. And so that's where, where we'll focus here today, okay? So of course they are connected, right? And, and, and clearly both important and essential roles in mammalian metabolism. Oops. And if you, there we go, right? So you got methionine here, you know, it's certainly involved in methyl donation, methyl metabolism, and that's where the connection takes place. Protein synthesis, of course, cysteine biosynthesis, et cetera. Choline, um, you know, involved in, in, again, methyl metabolism as well, fat metabolism, acetylcholine, and of course, cell membrane structure through phospho, phosphatidylcholine. So they, they both have roles in metabolism, and certainly you can connect them, uh, you can connect them also within methyl metabolism. It's from one of the reviews focused on human metabolism, a little bit older review, but again, clearly you see here that you can get uh, choline here through betaine and then uh, uh, trimethylation of uh, and regeneration through SAM anyway, back to form phosphatidylcholine. So again, they are connected biochemically. Of course, McFadden could do the biochemistry way more than, more than I could, and he's right here, so he's easy to harass. But anyway, so they are connected. So, it's, so we also have these data from goats. Uh, this is the only study that I, at least I'm aware of that really has looked at this through uh, quantitative means in terms of using radioisotopes um, and looking at those in vivo. And you know, kind of the bottom line here, if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, choline irreversible loss here, methionine irreversible loss here, the amount of choline that ends up in methionine, which is, or methyl ends up in methionine, which is essentially zero but certainly you see that some of the methionine uh, methyl ends up in choline. So, you know, methionine methyl conversion accounted for about 28% of the, of the entry rate and 6% of the choline pool. Now, this actually, from my perspective, really needs to be done in dairy cattle, right? And actually 15 years ago, I actually worked out a protocol with stable isotopes where we actually could do this, but uh, never got it uh, funded and things like that. But it'd be kind of fun to really look at that and, and really let us help us answer that question. So. So we're left, on the other hand, in terms of, you know, so what do the data say? So, of course, it's reasonable to hypothesize, right, because of that connection, that there are interrelations between supplies of methionine and choline. You know, if we supply methionine, might we be able to meet some of the need for choline? If we supply choline, are we, spare, are we meeting or sparing some of the need for methionine? And so, you know, back to transition, we've got now a body of work collected over the last 20, 25 years. What are the data, what do the studies tell us, right, about how these nutrients work in the transition cow? So this is the first one. Uh, this was done, Rich Erman's group out of Maryland, um, done uh, before the transition cow was a thing um, and before many of you in the room were born, or some of you in the room were born anyway. Um, you know, where they actually fed increasing amounts of protected choline and looked at milk yield as well as other things and showed uh, fairly nice production responses. Okay, so this is kind of where things started back in the early 90s. I got some of the youngins laughing here at my comment about uh, before you were born. So, okay, so then we came along, and this is actually our first study. We, we conducted this study starting in, the, in, in uh, 1998, 1999, right after I got to Cornell. Uh, Mike Piepenbrink, it was part of, his, uh, uh, part of his PhD. And what we did is we fed increasing levels of choline. Okay, that's the actual amount of choline in uh, protected form for 21 days before calving until 63 days after calving. Now, one of the things we did do, recognizing potential relationships, we did feed some corn gluten meal, right, to provide some methionine. Now, you'll know that, of course, we're feeding corn gluten meal to provide methionine. We're probably lysine limited. Um, but just for perspective, some of you remember uh, CPM dairy, right? So um, the CPM dairy calculations, if you look at typical basal diets without methionine supplementation and CPM, it'd be about 1.8% of MP or somewhere in that range. We were running about 2.1 with the with the corn gluten meal, whereas requirements, quote unquote, would be more around 2.3 or so. So we weren't all the way there to what somebody might consider to be a, a methionine supplemented uh, diet, but we, we were trying to acknowledge and, and go part way there. Okay, just a caveat with that study. So what we saw here, we saw quadratic trends anyway for um, for milk yield uh, in terms of pot or increased milk yield with uh, with choline. Uh, fat yield, fat-corrected milk, um, 
no effect on, on protein yield, and again, choline trends for uh, increased total solids yield. Again, one of the things with this study, uh, you know, first study out of the gate, it was back in the day when we, we thought that, you know, we could do 12 cows per treatment on a transition cow study, and that was adequate, and we don't do that anymore. We're 25 to 30 cows per treatment, just because these studies, there's enough variability there that you really can be, if you're underpowered, that's a, that's a, that's a bad place to be. So we try to be much, much better now in that, and I guess, I guess that's learning. So liver triglycerides, um, again, if you think about choline, um, its role in, in, in non-ruminant species, you know, classic, de classic deficiency symptoms of choline are triglyceride accumulation, right? So role in, in fat metabolism in the liver. So we biopsy liver from these cows, and uh, at least you see a directional decrease here in liver triglyceride. Here's day one, here's day 21, and cows fed the increasing amounts of choline, okay? Now we did some, uh, we also saw increased uh, concentrations of glycogen, again, perhaps an indicator of, of carbohydrate status in those cows as cows are fed increasing amounts of, of choline. Okay, the other thing you can do, and this is Drakeley's famous uh, NEFA uh, schematic anyway, the other thing you do is you can use some old fashioned uh, uh, bucket chemistry that was developed long before McFadden was born, um, and he's way more advanced now, but you can actually use, uh, you can biopsy liver from these cows, you can take it back to the lab, you can slice it up. Actually, he's borrowed my, my slicer, so it's so we'll at least have some shared uh, equipment there, I, I suppose. And you can incubate those, uh, those slices with radio-labeled substrates. You can incubate radio radio-labeled fatty acids, you can incubate radio-labeled um, propionate and say, okay, how, what effects are you having on at least maximal conversions of these substrates to products, right? Again, fairly crude in the context of today's technology, but uh, again, and, and it's been referred to as the biology of dying tissue because once it comes out of the cow, you got a few hours to work with it unless you can figure out a way to, to keep it going. So. Um, so anyway, so you can actually take a look at uh, conversion of radiolabeled fatty acids to, to uh, CO2 uh, and to store to serified products, and then maybe by difference or pro by proxy get an index of VLDL uh, export. And again, in, in, in monogastric species and other, this is really the, the pathway affected by, by choline. So again, get an indication there of what's going on, okay? So that's what we did, right? So we looked at uh, conversion of radiolabeled palmitate to CO2 and to basically triglycerides within the liver itself. And we saw no effect on uh, that capacity of the liver slices to convert to CO2, to oxidize, but we did see decreases in the rate at which, or the capacity to store them as, uh, as a sterified product, which would, again would imply better export. Okay, so better export is VLDL essentially by difference. Again, a, a fairly crude uh, technique, but it is what it is. So um, we also had looked at propionate metabolism, right? You know, the, and the concept being, of course, that lower, lower triglyceride accumulation promotes gluconeogenesis or vice versa. Okay, those things are linked. And again, not significant, but certainly directionally anyway, you know, you know again, moving in the direction we might expect anyway as those livers uh, better metabolize those fatty acids. Okay, then uh, Grummer's group came along and use their uh, triglyceride, basically a feed restriction model that they've used over time and others have used over time to look at um, uh, basically effective treatment on triglyceride accumulation during feed restriction and showed anyway that uh, choline supplement supplementation certainly decreased uh, uh, triglyceride accumulation during that feed restriction model, again, applying better export, and then also facilitated disposal um, of those uh, of those triglycerides after cows were returned after I'm sorry not cow, uh, yeah cows non-pregnant non-lactating cows were returned to um, were returned to uh, full feed okay all right so just to summarize I'm going to move fairly quickly here because because uh, um, we all can read right so some other research feeding choline to transition cows is done at Purdue um, you know, increase milk yield on one of the treatments, decrease the other one, so maybe an RUP interaction there, although that has not been repeated to my knowledge. Uh, liver triglycerides decrease by feeding protected choline to high BCS cows. You know, again, uh, you know, partial subset of the treatment. Missouri work, uh, shear it all, you know, increasing it by milk yield by 5.3 pounds a day. Italian work, milk yield increase, decrease NEFA, NEFA cholesterol ratio, which would imply as a proxy anyway, maybe better liver uh, fatty acid metabolism. Again, crudely, okay. Uh, work at Guelph, right, protected choline, Zara et al, increased milk yield by just under three pounds a day. Um, effects on metabolites were not significant. 
work done overseas, uh, John Newbold and others, um, you know, protected choline, increased milk yield overall, decreased liver triglyceride, and in that study, circulating beta-hydroxybutyrate concentrations, okay? Um, some more work, right? Protected choline, increased milk protein, decreased triglycerides, uh, did not affect uh, blood NEFAs or ketones, uh, increased expression of genes related to processing of fatty acids, VLDL. Uh, Genevieve Gretzky, so Illinois work there, um, protected choline, non-significant increase in, in milk yield, but you see the numerical change, and then some Brazilian work. So, uh, so again, you get, the, you get the pattern here, okay? Then the most recent work out of University of Florida, Marco Zanobi, um, working with, uh, with uh, uh, sadly, the late Charlie Staples and, uh, and uh, uh, Jose Santos. You know, had basically four treatments. They had protected choline and two different dietary strategies prepartum. Uh, dietary strategy didn't really mean anything relative to responses to choline. Choline from 17 uh, days pre-calving to 21 days after calving. And again, as you can see, you had uh, increases in milk yield, energy corrected milk during the first 15 days of lactation, and then, uh, you know, increased milk by almost five pounds a day over the first 40 weeks of lactation. Okay, so concentrations of, the, of NEFAs and ketones weren't altered. Liver triglycerides actually were similar in this experiment. Cows fed choline, uh, produced colostrum with higher IgGs. Calves, again, we're increasingly looking at what goes on in calves, of course, in these transition cow studies, right? But for, I'm guilty, as are many, of, of kind of not linking those dots together, but, you know, it's Rodrigo Milano's not nodding to me, yes, you got to remember the calves, so Rodrigo will try, okay? Um, you know, but ca calves from cows fed uh, protected choline at higher body weight gain, okay? Again, results largely independent of prepartum diet. They did a companion study also where they used a feed restriction model similar to what Wisconsin had done and showed that uh, choline supplementation dose dependently decreased liver triglyceride accumulation. So again, pretty, from my perspective, pretty consistent data sets relative to, you know, connecting the dots here on, on these types of effects. Marcos also shared with me a meta-analysis. Um, and, uh, and I'm feeling a little bit like Kristen did yesterday with Norman out there talking about feed variability because I know I got Ian Lane right over there who's like the king of meta-analysis and I am not, okay? Um, so again, they did uh, a meta-analysis of studies involving protected choline. This was a poster at uh, ADSA this last summer. You can see their eligibility criteria here, um, you know, again, and, and where they ended up relative to um, the data. I've been told that this, is, this has been accepted for publication, so it should be coming out relatively soon, but uh, uh, Marcus was kind enough to share his, his poster with me, okay? So if you look then, at just uh, on the left side, this is, uh, uh, if you look at, uh, this is dry matter, oh, this is cool. I actually point, get to point at this and it shows up there. That's awesome, right? So intake pre-calving, right? This is by dose of choline. Um, no, no real, res I mean, you know, not a lot going on there in terms of prepartum intake. Uh, you know, milk yield, energy corrected milk, you see those positive, fairly consistent positive trends anyway, or positive directionality relative to milk yield responses with choline supplementation. And then we've got the forest plot over here where you have the zero response in terms of weighted mean difference, uh, the, the, the individual studies here that, that they included in their data set, uh, the weighting, and then, you know, an overall weighted mean difference of about 1.6 kilos a day, which is about three and a half pounds of milk, okay? So anyway, so that, that study be out there, um, et cetera. But again, you know, I think reasonably reflecting the literature, okay? All right, so just summary, right? So overall, um, I would say with choline, we're, we're looking at, I would say, fairly consistently positive effects on milk yield. Mechanisms consistent with improved fatty acid metabolism in liver, export as VLDL. Um, the effects on metabolites are, are inconsistent. And I've kind of said that, you know, again, you know, we, we tend to think, we, we tend to want to see something in terms of metabolites, in terms of BHPAs, in terms of NEFAs, um, but you're not probably not going to consistently see that with choline, right? It's not directly anti Lipolytic, lipolytic, right? So there's no reason to expect that it's going to be, um, you know, it's going to be, you know, go lower NEFAs per se, unless cows eat better, right, as a result of it. But I don't think that effects will be consistent. It's also not going to be anti directly, it's not going to be uh, directly anti ketogenic, right? So again, I agree with Lance's comments there relative to these. We look, think about these things more as symptoms anyway, of what's going on in the in the cow rather than harmful things by themselves, and so you're probably not going to see direct effects on, on, uh, on, on blood ketones probably in most situations. That, that's not saying you never will, right? But I think it's just not something you should expect as a routine response. What about methionine, right? 
So this is just a, a summary, anyway, of the, of the studies that I'm aware of and, and, and included relative to responses to primarily methionine supplementation, uh, primarily beginning before calving and continuing into lactation. And so you've got a number of studies here done, you know, essentially over the last 25 years almost, um, you know, where, uh, again, looking at, you know, generally speaking, they're protected methionine. This was an infusion study with methionine and methionine lysine. This was a, a, an analog uh, study with HMTBA. This was methionine, you know, with or without folic acid and B12. This is isopropyl ester of, of HMTBA and, and with protected methionine. Similar uh, treatment or similar, at least, uh, uh, approach here in terms of what they used and then protected methionine in this study. And, and again, you know, looking here at responses, right, you see in some kilos, so, you know, uh, fairly consistent responses as well. Okay, a couple treatments here where they only had milk protein percentage effects anyway, but the majority of these studies do sh are showing some effect on, on milk yield through methionine supplementation. All right. So this, is, uh, this was the first one, right? So this was a side project when I was a grad student, uh, and this was before the transition cow was the transition cow. Um, and we were working with Jimmy Clark at the time on my master's, and uh, kind of did this along, along the side with a protective methionine source. Uh, so we had 24 cows, again, a small study, seven to 10 days before expected calving through 18 weeks. We had zero versus 20 grams a day of protective methionine by top dress. Um, our pre-calving diet, and again, I laugh, you know, it's, it's fun to poke fun at yourself sometimes, right? So they were fed a once daily, a typical dry cow ration consisting of grass hay, about five kgs, corn silage, three kgs, grain mix, about four kgs. Of course, that sounds almost like a controlled energy diet, right? And that was before it was, it was a thing. Um, and here's the best part, right? Consisting of ground shell corn and a, uh, and a pre-calving conditioner. Uh, 0.4 kgs of dry matter, 50% protein, not more than 40% NPN, and that was basically the description we had, right? So, um, yeah, I don't think I would, probably wouldn't get this, I don't know, I'd, I'd reject this one today if I were reviewing it, so um, maybe not on results, but I'd at least make myself go back and describe my diets better, right? Okay? All right. And then, uh, you know, I guess you learn how to feed cows over time. Uh, this was early 90s when we formulated these diets and did this study. Um, and so, you know, alfalfa haylage, corn silage, uh, you know, corn and corn, uh, ground, corn meal and soybean meal are cheap in, in Illinois, so we might as well feed a lot of them. And, uh, you know, requisite soy hulls, those of you Illinois people know uh, you got to put soy hulls in every diet fed there. Uh, donated by ADM, at least they used to be, right? So, so it was, you know, you put soy hulls in every diet. Um, and then you know, we'll mix them there. 19% crude protein, you know, 25 NDF. Uh, you know, this one would, would probably scare me today in a variety of different ways, right? But anyways, and 0.47% phosphorus. So thanks, Larry, for getting us to feed lower phosphorus to these cows too, okay? But anyways, at the time, okay? That said, right, we had responses to methionine supplementation, right? So intakes uh, were similar post-calving, okay? Uh, milk yield. And, uh, and fat percent kind of led to um, essentially, you know, a, a significant you know, response relative to fat corrected milk, right? So you're looking at, you know, 2.7 kg, so a fairly nice response there to methionine, despite, you know, probably everything else. Okay, uh, Mike Saha came along, right? So Mike in his PhD work at uh, at New Hampshire. Um, working with Chuck Schwab, again, had cows that essentially through infusion, um, cows supplement methionine lysine beginning pre-calving had, had higher yields of energy corrected milk compared with either methionine or, or the basil. So again, saw particularly when methionine and lysine were there together, had nice responses relative to, to energy corrected milk post-calving. All right, we came along, this was actually the second study that, that Mike Piepenring did for as part of his PhD, um, where we actually used the analog of, of methionine HMTBA. Um, and essentially what we were trying to do was at the time, you know, had a control that was essentially unsupplemented. We, we had a middle treatment where we were, we were supplementing at, at essentially uh, CPM dairy, uh, you know, levels that would be considered to be at requirement for lactating cows and then a high level here where we went above and beyond, right? And you see the, the levels there in terms of CPM numbers that we went to. Of course, those are lower than what we see in the current versions of CNCPS, right? Just for those that uh, don't have the history, okay? And what we largely saw was quadratic effects, right? We saw a quadratic effect on milk yield, 3.5% fat-corrected milk, total solids uh, yield, et cetera, okay? 
So uh, the intermediate HMTBA did increase milk yield, um, did not and did not affect circulating NEFA or or BHBA. Uh, no effect on liver triglycerides or glycogen. No effect on propionate metabolism or fatty acid metabolism in vitro. We made the same measurements in this study we made with the study with protected choline. Didn't see anything relative to you know, those variables relative to fatty acid metabolism or even uh, gluconeogenesis in this particular study. Okay, but again, when we fed at quote unquote requirements, saw some response. Uh, Rick Grummer's group, they applied their same feed restriction model, um, looking at liver triglyceride uh, 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 responses to HMTBA and had no effect in this study on, uh, on liver triglyceride accumulation or uh, depletion. Okay, so clearly working differently than choline did in, in their model. Okay, uh, north of the border, right? So protecting methionine with or without folic acid or B12, no effect on milk yield. Uh, they did see an increase here in milk protein percentage. Uh, liver triglycerides were actually increased in cows fed protecting methionine in this particular study. And then Ryan Ordway, uh, again, working with, working with Chuck at uh, UNH and his PhD, had a, a basal diet here or diet supplemented with, with the HMT or HMBI or protective methionine from 21 days before calving until 140 days. Did not see any effect in this study relative to uh, yields of milk or fat corrected milk. Um, did see a milk protein percentage response anyway with both HM, HMBI and protective methionine, but they did not look at uh, metabolites or liver composition uh, in that study. And then the Illinois group, uh, Yona Osorio, working with Juan Luer, um, they had, uh, and again, I've got this, what I've done in the next few slides is they, they've, they've carved, they carved their data set up so they published multiple papers out of it, so I kind of amalgamated it for uh, hopefully convenience anyway. And so um, they had about 38 multiparous cows, okay. Uh, the treatments anyway, they had a control methionine at 1.8% uh, of MP using NRC 2001, uh, HMBI at, uh, you see the, the, the levels here in terms of the NRC model, and then they had protective methionine again at, uh, at similar uh, levels anyway here. Lysine they maintained here at about 6.6 uh, six to 6.7% six, of MP before calving and 6.1 to 6.2% uh, after calving. All right, so cows fed uh, methionine pre and postpartum. They tended to have uh, a higher uh, neutrophil phagocytosis at day 21 post calving. They had lower serum uh, plasma serial plasmin and serum amyloid A, so that would be indicative of has better oxidative status, lower inflammation, uh, greater plasma oxygen and radical absorbance capacity. Uh, you see the, again, you can read uh, glutathione and carnitine, altered gene networks in liver consistent with the changes in oxidative metabolism and inflammation described above. Um, uh, greater methylation of PPAR alpha, which is involved in the fatty acid metabolism, however, no effect on liver triglyceride. Okay, so you're seeing a different pattern here, a response anyway, in the, in the, in the Illinois data here relative, to, um, relative to, to other things, again, but likely still underpinning production responses. And then, uh, most recently anyway, uh, their group, 60 uh, cows here in this study, uh, they used, to, this was focused on protected methionine, and so had again, two treatments, uh, probably similar in terms of what they were targeting anyway, in terms of uh, methionine levels and supplementation. And again, uh, you know, they saw nice responses here relative to uh, dry matter intake, both pre-calving and post-calving, whoops, pre-calving and post-calving with the, with the uh, methionine supplementation. Nice uh, responses here relative to milk yield and energy corrected milk. Okay, so again, you know, showing those, those types of things. Okay, also a little bit of work here done uh, focused on, um, you know, aspects of, of, you know, what's going on relative to the calf. Uh, again, this is based on some of, the, some of the, their, their latter work here where they, they determined that, uh, again, that prepartum uh, protective methionine did increase calf birth weight in this study uh, and upregulated amino acid transport and modulated the mTOR pathway in the placentome, which would be responsive to, to, new, to supply of various nutrients. So again, a lot of dots here left to connect, but just showing that there's some, some implications here relative to what may be going on relative to the, the, the calf or the fetus and the newborn. And then again, more, more stuff for the calf. You know, cows again fed, uh, fed uh, methionine, protected methionine here for 21 days before calving until calving. In this study, again, different study, similar birth weight and average daily gain to seven weeks. Uh, 
lower reactive oxygen metabolites at 14 days, right? So again, I mean, so Angel this morning showed some effects of, you know, prepartum uh, oxidative status on the calf and, and, and things like that. And so showing lower reactive oxygen at 14 days. Um, some alterations in insulin signaling, glucose metabolism, as well as liver metabolism with thionine, choline, homocysteine, which needs some more, again, it, I think it needs some more work to get some, get interpret and get some interpretation there. So overall summary of research feeding, right? So either protective methionine, HMTBA, or the isopropyl ester of HMB, um, I would say consistently affect positive effects on milk yield and or milk protein percentage, um, but doesn't really seem to relate, at least not directly, to liver fatty acid or glucose metabolism. And you know, the data are kind of steering us toward an immune function, oxidative metabolism, liver functionality uh, mechanism. So to that end, uh, where's Kristen? You didn't, I didn't tell you you are going to show you. No, not other Kristen. Not you. It's not all about you. All right, Gallagher. Where's Gallagher? All right, sorry. Too easy. Okay, so <laughs> Gallagher, right? So Kristen Gallagher, I wasn't even thinking about that. All right, so Kristen Gallagher uh, is an, was an honor student working with us, graduating Cornell, went to minor, and uh, is working up there now as a, as a research intern for the year, and, and uh, I think doing a great job, right? That's what they all say. Okay, all right. So Kristen, this was a summer intern project between, uh, that was really spearheaded by Adiseo and Perina um, on commercial dairies in New York. We kind of came in as a collaborator and, and helped on, on some of the analysis side, stuff like that. So there were uh, 12 commercial dairies in summer of 2018. And basically what, we were, what they, they slash we were doing was focused on methionine supplementation really postpartum. And so, you know, some, and th this is actually a cow level analysis here that I'm going to show you the, the data from anyway. But essentially, you know, our herds that we consider to be control, right, were supplying, uh, you know, lesser amounts of methionine, things like that. The, cow the herds, herds that were, uh, that were quote unquote the experimental herds or the treatment herds, they were supplying uh, basically more than 11 and a quarter grams per day of a protected methionine source, right? So one of the things that Kristen did, right, she took a lot of blood samples um, and things like that and analyzed a bunch of different analytes here. And then what, uh, you know, kind of between Maris McCarthy, who was working for Adiseo at the time, uh, uh, Allison Kerwin, who was a PhD student of mine, kind of worked with Kristen and they came up with this metabolite health index. Um, now it, it was adapted closely from some of the Italian work that uh, by Giuseppe Bertoni, Emilio Trevisi, and Piacenza, who have tried, who have looked at liver functionality indexes involving various analytes, and, and uh, they originally called it the Maris Allison Index. I said that's probably not going to fly at ADSA, so we, we called it something else. Um, and essentially relates to albumin concentrations. Of course, albumin is a negative acute phase protein, um, uh, cholesterol, and then bilirubin here again that relates to liver enzymes and things like that. Okay. So again, one of the things that the Italians had done is they had, you know, they had developed their liver functionality index based on differences like between blood sampling at day three and blood sampling at day 28, right? And we're like, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna do that at the farm level, you know, individual cows, things like that. Yet we do have farms that are willing to sample cows, right, within a shot, within a window post calving, right? And so we said in a single sample, you know, between, in this case, between five and 17 days of milk, can we develop something that looks kind of that look make kind of makes sense and moves with direction of liver functionality? Okay, so it's one of the challenges where we ended up is it's a relative index, right? But again, it's a place to place to start. Okay, but but essentially in this study, you know, they associated a, a one unit increase in in this metabolic health index with about 1.3 kgs of energy corrected milk, and across the cow level data set could explain up to about 22 kgs of milk yield in early lactation. Uh, one unit increase in, in uh, the metabolic health index or metabolite health index resulted in, again, just under one kg of week four milk. And again, based on the range we saw, it could explain up to about 15 kgs of, of related to about that much week four milk. And then finally, cows from herds fed protective methionine had, uh, had a greater uh, metabolite health index than cows from herds fed control. So again, back to directionally supporting the Illinois work in terms of, you know, cows or cows or herds, right, supplemental with methionine had better indices relative to, to some of these things that may relate to inflammatory state, um, you know, potential liver functionality, oxidative metabolism, things like that. Okay, so again, I think to be continued in, in different ways. So what about interactions, right? We haven't answered that question yet. 
Not a lot of data out there. This is uh, Tawny Chandler's work from some of her PhD work working with Heather White at uh, Wisconsin Madison, where essentially Tawny took uh, neonatal hepatocytes and then looked at uh, choline and methionine supplementation in vitro and, and relative to VLDL, right? Back to again that export pathway that, that previous work would suggest to be responsive to. Um, to choline, and that's actually what she showed here, is that in vitro anyway, increasing amounts of choline, increased VLDL um, uh, export anyway, no effect of methionine on, on, uh, on export. So again, back to the notion that they likely operate a bit differently. So this study from China right here, um, again, this was 48 cell multiparous Chinese Holstein cows. Uh, they had four treatments. They had uh, a control, protected choline, protected methionine, and then uh, the choline and methionine combination. 21 days before expected calving through 21 days after calving, okay? And so, you know, both, uh, you know, essentially no interactions, right? So interact suggesting, uh, you know, either independence of response or, or whatever to these, to these nutrients. Uh, so protected, both protected methionine, protected choline, increased prepartum, postpartum intake and yield of fat corrected milk. Uh, they both decreased concentrations of NEFA and BHBA increased glucose. Again, I don't know as those are gonna be, um, consistently altered, but that's what they reported. Um, similar effects of protective methionine choline on various indices of oxidative metabolism, and again, you know, suggesting potential additivity of, of response, okay? So just to summarize and conclude, right, I think they're both important nutrients. Um, responses to choline, you know, consistently increased milk yield, mechanisms consistent with, with uh, VLDL export, improved fatty acid metabolism, lower liver triglycerides, uh, pretty inconsistent effects, though, I would say, in terms of NEFA and blood ketones, and again, I think that's, that's logical. Methionine, um, you know, again, increased milk yield, milk protein percentage, um, arguably maybe a little bit less consistent, but still pretty consistent responses overall. And again, I think the mechanism looks like it relates probably more to oxidative status, immune function, effects on liver functionality, rather than liver fatty acid metabolism per se. Uh, both, again, choline, of course, gets lots of attention to in the maternal human literature, right, as Joe has pointed out before. Um, and so both may have relevance uh, with a calf, but I think we just need more, more folks actually doing those types of studies where we're looking at nutrient supply to mom and how it affects the calf. And so certainly suggest potentially a way for, for at least some degree of additivity of response, okay? So with that, again, I, I thank you all for taking your time to come to the conference this year, and I'd be glad to, if there's time, moderator, uh, I'd be glad to take a question or two. Okay, thanks. We have time for a few questions. Dan is there. Here, we'll uh, wait for the mic, Dan. Um, I, I don't do research in this area, obviously, but I've been, been reading about it and somewhat confused because I, I like the conclusions that the extra methionine is probably doing something other than supplying a limited amino acid for milk protein synthesis because it's looking over just the published ones, I, I don't know the field well enough to know what else is going on, but it seems like... Um, you, you're not always getting an increase in protein yield. Very often you don't. Um, and the magnitude of the increase in the percent of um, protein in the milk isn't really spectacular either. It's well within the range of the sort of you know, artifact increase in um, protein percent that you get when you have lower fat percent. You know, that's, that's a known phenomenon that um, very often, if you got, even if it's not statistically significant, if you get a drop in fat protein percent just by pro relaxing that dilution of the protein in the solids, you get this little, whoop, this little bump of one or two tenths of a percent in protein. Um, D Dale Bauman set me straight years ago when I got all excited about an increase in, in uh, milk protein on a fat depressing diet. and. Um, he explained to me slowly, I eventually understood, but I'm just, I'm just wondering, I, I, I think that's real good evidence that it's working some other way than just supplying it. And the other one is a question, um, and I don't know enough about microbiology, but, or if the microbial populations produce methionine from elemental sulfur, 
But a lot of our diets now with byproducts, um, especially some of the distillers' grains, come with extra sulfur um, as a bonus or something. And I'm just wondering if these studies done, you know, in different backgrounds with respect to elemental sulfur mm -hmm. um, in there would come out differently or the same. I don't have any idea, I just have questions. Yeah, so. great point, Dan. I'm not sure I can, I can fully answer, especially the second part. I mean, I think the first part gets into thinking about things like nutrients like methionine as regulators of metabolism in that transition cow or regulators of function in that transition cow versus kind of more drivers or participants in milk protein synthesis. And so you're kind of looking at different phenomena, I think, in that transition cow versus, and it kind of gets us into that nutrition 2.0 that Barry Bradford likes to talk about in terms of nutrients, not just as nutrients, but actually regulators of function um, in the animal. Relative to the second part, I, I'm not sure, I can't pull the diet composition of these studies. I would say by and large, I mean, they're not loaded with, with distillers or other things that are bringing a lot of sulfur into the diet. So, but I, I also, you know, agree that either methionine or, or analogs of methionine have certainly been looked at in certain ways relative to uh, ruminal effects and, and perhaps responses therein and things like that. So, but again, that's an area that needs some further sorting. So, thanks though. Do we have another question? We've got time for one more. No? Steven. Back in Oh, sure. Please, yeah. Andrew's quick. Here's a quick question. These days on dairies, the financial lender is sitting around the table, and they're using some sort of metric. They're deciding, yes, you can do this, no, you can do this, based on feed cost per cow. Both of these additives significantly increase the feed cost of the diet. How do we work with the lenders? How do we educate the lender yeah. as to the value of these? So uh, again, uh, agreed, right? And, and certainly recognize the financial realities that come along. Um, I, I think that, you know, the thing that, that I, and I think that you gotta keep considering, right, is, is you know, so supplementation of, of methionine and or choline, right, in transition, right, you're, you're, you're relying on a very targeted period of supplementation that when you, when you dilute, when, when or so if, you're, if you're only focused on a transition cow response, okay, and obviously, you know, depending on price of, of milk protein and things like that, we may certainly supplement methionine certainly far longer into lactation, obviously, right, to try to, to, try to capture that too. Um, but if you're talking about just transition period application, obviously you've got the ability to, you know, if you're getting a response that extends out, right you know that's going to significantly dilute that you know dilute that added cost for that window of time you know across a much greater period of time right so i think that's one way you, you do that and i think the data overall you know do support that you're going to have you know again responses that are going to, that are going to last out into lactation for which you're getting a, you're making an investment now relative to achieving an, an overall return okay so that's the way i guess i approach it but i totally get it right relative to you know again uh, those those types of issues. I just think things have been pulled out of diets that have, have cost New York dairy producers. Oh, I, I agree, right? So the comment was uh, he just thinks things have been pulled out of diets have cost dairy producers money. I, I would agree with that, right? I think. You know, we've done, we've done presentations here and other places on how do you make decisions, right, on those types of things, too. And I realize that's, that's easier, you know, it's e easy for me to stand up here and, and, and talk about that and harder when you're working right at the farm level in different ways, right? But, yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks. Great. Let's thank Tom again.